management is not a thing, and camera switching is always delayed. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, you know, we're back, guys. We're back in studio. Not just not just me and Mike. We also got Mister Mister Jeremy Asipo <laughs> Bone Crusher in here. Back in the studio. It feels so good to be back. Reunited, and it feels so good. <laughs> Um, I always no, it really to, does feel good though. Yeah, no, it it, does it, feel it, it feels good, good it, to, to get back in here. And to be honest, I'll I'll be honest, it's not like any one of us actually had Corona or anything like that. But as a show of support, we did the Skype thing. Mm-hmm. But I, I, not even just a show of support. I think we all discussed like it just in case till we figured out what the hell was going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Safer. Yeah. But I mean, speak for yourself. Mike said you didn't have Corona. Man, I drank about 12 Coronas last night, okay? So let's <laughs> let's put things into perspective here, all right? Oh. The fights, yeah. The uh, fights. Yeah. The fights. Are we going to uh, mention what technical difficulties that we have had news. Michael distraught it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Where's, where is David, you might ask? Well, David's dead. He's locked in my basement. Um, <laughs> I, I'm just... I'm, I'm actually really really upset about this because we had it working and just as we're about to record dave we can't hear david uh through our speaker but it was working when we heard him in playback so we could hear him in playback but we couldn't hear him in speaker so that really really broke my heart a little bit so we can't get david on but i'm going to be working tirelessly all week to get him back for hopefully friday if he wants to do the preview or sunday if that's a thing so yeah you know, David's not going to be on, but... And it, you know why it upset me so much? Because I'm an extremely egotistical human being, and I wanted things to go right. That's... Well, wait. I failed to see how those are connected, but they are both true. I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you there, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you want to get into some news? I think there's one... Actually, there are a couple of matchups we failed to... Uh, we didn't cover uh, on Friday. I don't even think we even did news on Friday, but... The big one is Michael Chandler signed to the UFC, possible standby for Khabib... Versus Gaethje. I'm I'm shocked at this one because Chandler for a while has been kind of playing this game of, you know, I'm I'm coming to the UFC. I'm coming. Just <laughs> wait. And then he's like, sorry, it was just a negotiating tactic to get more money from Bellator. But Jeez. he's he's here towards the end of his career. What do you guys think? I'm excited. Uh, USADA. It might be a bit of a thing that I'm interested to see what happens. I'm not accusing him of anything. I'm not saying he's on stuff. I'm not saying he isn't on stuff. You know, it's just you look at Michael Chandler's physique, and oh, don't tell me you're you're going by the sniff test. So he's no indicting I, the man for being. J- I'm, J- J- I'm not J- indicting J- anybody. So that's his why first fight is against Khabib, or he's coming for Khabib. No, so the the idea is is that in case Khabib or Justin can't go, right? Um, he'll be the replacement. Exactly. I, I heard as well because. Um, Poirier dropped out of the uh, the Ferguson fight. Well, did, he didn't drop out. The negotiations were still ongoing. And he pulled out because he wasn't getting nearly what he deserved. And uh, Dana tried to replace him with Michael Chandler. And I, uh, think, uh, I think that one kind of fell through as well. So I think at the moment, he's just a standby. I, you know what I heard? I heard um, Tony Ferguson was offered Michael Chandler. And Tony Ferguson said, no, pay Dustin Poirier. And I'll Ooh. fight him. And then... Fighter solidarity, man. Yeah. And then Dana went to Dustin Poirier and said, uh, we'll give you the money, fight Michael Chandler. And Michael Chan- and Dustin Poirier, in show of support for Tony, said, no mass. It could be a rumor, but that's why I heard. If that's true, respect for both of them because it's okay to acknowledge, like, we have solidarity. We have common interests as fighters, even if you're my opponents. You know, broadly speaking, as as employees or contractors of the UFC would have you believe – you know, you share a common interest in everyone getting a, a larger piece of the pie. What is the opposition to Michael Chandler getting that money? It's that's what I, it sounds like I'm hearing. Is you mean it po- doesn't Poirier getting that money, or or Michael Chandler getting that matchup? I think I think the opposition Why? to him getting the matchup uh, is that um, they're both kind of wise to the negotiating tactics being employed by Dana White. Okay. Where it's like Tony Ferguson is like, no, you know, you're you're not going to be able to swindle Dustin Poirier like this out of a matchup. He's who's a really good human being. Um, you know, the Good Fight Foundation. And- yeah, he, he he does a why, lot of charity work. I, I and- think my question is, why are both Ferguson and Poirier saying pay him, pay him? Oh, because why? because because um. You know, Pori wasn't getting paid what what he felt he deserved, and so he held out. And uh, I guess 
in uh, Ferguson came out in support of him, mm-hmm. and uh, both of them were like, you, you know, you're not going to be able to. You're, they shut down the negotiating tactics that Dana White was trying to use. Basically. Right, right. Ah, uh, okay. Because I got to learn more about the negotiation business part of it. Yeah, no. Look, it, it is what it is. Um, I, I look. I, it's sad that aspect of it, but the aspect that like I want to hear is how does Michael Chandler do in the UFC? You know, this is this is a guy who's you know been around Bellator, beat some tough guys, um, starched some some UFC veterans in the past, uh, starched Benson Henderson in his last fight. So this is a guy who can fight. You know what I'm saying? This is a guy who can fight. So. I'd like, As he do. I'd like to see him. I don't know how he does. I, I've seen clips of him wrestling with Kamaru Usman, and he looked very right. technical, yeah. using funks and scrambles in order to keep it a fairly even roll with someone up a weight class with him who's a world mm-hmm. champion. Um, clearly has a lot of power. Um, I, I want to see him against a top 15 opponent, right? I want to see him against, or, you know, maybe the bottom end of top 10, and then from there let's let's see what we can do let's generate some hype around this guy because let's face it a lot of people there's not as many eyes on bellator as you know we might like so yeah but this cross organizational kind of thing it's there's there's a lot of hype there's a lot of intrigue here uh like there was around ben Askren's career so i hope the ufc does it the right way how do you think he'll do mike um look i again (sighs) I, I hate going to this well, but you saw that. Like, I don't know. Like, a lot of guys. This isn't just a Michael Chandler thing. This is a lot of guys thing. Where it's like they come, they come over, and you just don't know what the testing pool's like, right? Because oh, UFC, we know what it's like. It's not good. In yeah, Bellator, yeah. It's non-existent, right? So because of that, you know, guys tend to come over, and for whatever reason, don't do as well. Aren't they, aren't as explosive? Have a lot more injuries. And have trouble cutting weight. You make with what's that your, what you will. Can right? you give examples of what's that? Your, what's your go-to occupation for guys who are amateurs but are getting paid? I say cab drivers. Who are you saying? For testing pools? Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. So for, for guys who are like. Yeah, I say like they're fighting cab drivers. Like, what do you say? Oh, oh. okay. Yeah, I, I say <laughs> crushing, he... crushing tomato cans. <laughs> yeah. I say okay. car salesman. Yeah, car salesman. But, that's it. Wait, but hold on, Mike. Just not, 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 not to say that. You know, he made an untruthful claim, but I'm just curious. What examples can you think of? Because obviously we know testing in other organizations is quite lax, and um, guys are roided to the gills, but can you think of any examples just for my... Well, the one that comes to mind is Will Brooks, right? Will Brooks. Um, now, I'm not saying Will Brooks. Like, if any guy I would say isn't on the juice and probably just came in here and struggled, came into the UFC and struggled... It's probably Will Brooks. Man, that was dis- – dis- I was very excited for, for yeah. Will Brooks. That was very disappointing. But, he beat Chandler twice as yeah, well, right? Didn't yeah, he? he beat Chandler twice. But for whatever reason, you know, that – like, there's just guys who – even the pre-USADA, post-USADA, you know, Henan Burrell, Hendricks. Hector Lombard. Hector Lombard, right? Like, it's – and Hector Lombard's a Bellator guy too, so not anymore. Not not anymore. Now he's a bare knuckle FC guy, right? Oh, no, you mean used to be a Bellator guy? Yeah, he, yeah. he came from Bellator initially. Yeah. You're right. And he, and a lot of people were excited, and he was winning a lot, and then all of a sudden, you saw that came in, and then yeah, right. Like, so I I don't know what's going to happen, and and you know, a lot of people would just like dismiss that and be like, oh, you know, just you know, he's gonna he's gonna be exactly the same. I don't know what he's gonna be like. That's fair, yeah. Because who's to say? Um, is this a step up in a level of competition? We really don't know. There's a lot of questions. And while in, I'd be reluctant to point to any one case and be like, that's evidence of steroids. No. Clearly there's yeah. some, you know, it plays some kind of a role, lax testing in other organizations. Mm-hmm. Probably a step up in competition has something to do with it as well. And that's what I'm most interested in seeing is yeah. how technically does he fare against uh, other, other fighters in the UFC? And yeah. one, I mean, it's not like, Top-level Bellator fighters aren't training with high-level UFC fighters. Like I said, he's training at Hard Knocks 365 with Kamaru Usman. And, yeah. But, yeah, any any other news or you guys want to talk about this more? Um, well, the one thing I do want to end off is I'm, I'm in no – I think this is already clear. I'm in no way accusing Michael Chandler of anything. It's just that, like, it's a point that no one ever talks about. It's like, you know, so they come over from organizations that have lax to li- little to no testing um, and – then after all of a sudden they struggle, and then we wonder why. Why are they struggling, right? And you know you can point to the UFC being the best organization in the world, but you can also point to the fact that, you know, yeah, 
It's multi multi causal, but in some cases, at some times, sure, yeah, yeah. of course, roids play a factor, yeah. or other PEDs, I guess. So, yeah. who would be a good debut fight against? I don't know if you guys already touched on that, but oh, let's uh, pull up, let, let me pull up the lightweight rankings because I'm actually curious. I already, I would like to see if Felder comes out of retirement. I think Felder is a great first matchup for him. That's interesting, and I can't remember Felder being grounded for long portions of his fight, like mm-hmm. being taken down. That'd right. be interesting. A hell, a hell raiser on the feet, right? Um, willing to take two, um, good chin. So Michael Chandler just can't like knock him out, um, like he's been doing with a lot of guys lately, where he's just for all re- for all of a sudden just found like some power in his hands. Yeah. Um, Michael Chandler can't like just not get get. Uh, Felder out of there. Yeah. So I think it'd just be a real tough fight for him. Felder's going to be moving forward, pushing yeah. that clinch range and doing and, and a long, long, long guy too. So I think Felder. Who's, who, who's a favorable matchup? Do you think oh. within the top fifteen that you could do for him? There, not like there's any. Can you name him off? Let's see. You know what? Before I name it off, I think Benil Daryush might be a decent match debut matchup for him. If yeah, you I like that, I like that because. Um, Dariush has dangers to his game, right? He's obviously a world black champion. World champion. Yeah. Um, and But his striking is a little bit reckless. So I don't think he's going to be someone that's necessarily going to exploit some of the tendencies, uh, weaknesses in stri- uh, his Felder, Chandler's white uh, striking game. But um, it, it'd make for an interesting banger, I think. Maybe you could do like uh, Charles Oliveira. Okay. Cowboy, the okay. Bel- the the, Bel- the Bellator killer. Yeah, I Wait, no, not th- Cowboy Oliveira, Charles Oliveira. Sorry, sorry, because he he was the one who defeated Will yeah, Brooks. Yeah, Actually, yeah. both Oliveiras defeated Will Brooks. Yeah, yeah. Um, Charles is the one who beat Kevin Lee in that that matchup before the, the shutdown. Um, man, anyway, you slice it. This is great. But who would you guys like to personally see out of that? I crop? well, I think I just want to see good stylistic matchups just to see how he could do, and I'd like to see him against a striker with good takedown defense. So a hooker, a Felder, <laughs> a hooker, eh? Yeah, a hooker, a hooker. Uh, a Dan Hooker, I think is is interesting. Um, yeah, Felder, if he comes out of retirement, I wouldn't mind seeing him against um, you know Michael Johnson, even though he's kind of fell off the map. Uh, Interesting. Is yeah. Johnson at forty-five or fifty-five right now? I guess he's one of those. That- I think he moved back down to fifty-five. Okay, that's, that's why. Um, but yeah, like I think Johnson's unfortunately, I just remembered, is a training partner of him. Was, oh, they're hard knock six three three six five yeah. guys. So that one, but that would be an interesting matchup. Yeah, but that's that's the thing. I just want to see because the thing about Bellator, um, he kind of got away. With, he kind of got away with. I'm gonna throw this power right hand and then take you down. Right, and I, I think we saw against Pitbull that, you know, against the higher guys, that's not necessarily going to work. Now, the thing about Pitbull is Pitbull is probably – I think if Pitbull and Volkanovski fought, that would be a very, very competitive fight. That'd so, be, that would be interesting. That would be interesting. Um, so, you know, it's not – you're talking about one of the best guys in the world. But, you know, I want to see how he does against a striker who's just not going to let him have the takedown. Because that just seemed to be a lot of what Chandler was facing. Um, I'm not saying this to be critical. I, I really do like Chandler. I think he could do well. I just want to see some tests. And is, the tests I want to see. Is Lamakachev maybe? I like that. I like that. That's a stiff test. It's just the name value of his long Makachev, unfortunately, is not there yet for the mainstream public. But as far as a te- uh, I mean, he's stylistic a student, test. He's a student of Habib. So, like, the Arabs love him. Right. Yeah, uh, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Not that. Uh, not that Habib and him are Arabic. They're, they're not. You. I'm just saying. Like you saw. You saw the reception they both got in Dubai. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. If you're trying to market him internationally, but yeah, there can be bigger names. But I think as far as intrigue, technically, that's a great one. If that's what you're looking for, someone who could potentially shut down the wrestling. Yeah, I want to mm-hmm. see somebody who can shut down the wrestling. Right? What does he do? Right? It does he keep going to the wrestling? Is he just such an overwhelmingly good wrestler that it doesn't matter? Mm-hmm. Um, does he does he have an an extra wrinkle to a striking game we haven't seen? Because I think that's probably where guys would exploit him, right? The the striking. Sure. Um. So yeah. Um. But I think I think I would like to see somebody who's got good takedown defense, not like excellent takedown defense. You know? How about how about I I, I for the same reasons I think Oliveira might be interesting because in that way it's not that he has great takedown defense, but it's that he's very dangerous on the ground. On the ground, yeah, of course. So there's a deterrence there in and of itself. But yeah. Any were there any interesting matchups? I I feel like there were a few that we just 
Yeah, no, it's just that the top fifteen is is hard to. No, I, I to meant like matchups announced recently. Um, I sure I'm sure there were some that we're just not we're, thinking. Yeah, of. we're not we're not thinking of. Uh, no, the other the other piece of news I got for all my basketball fans is they the Celtics uh, apparently had a spander locker room after game two. Um, Marcus Smart and uh, Jalen Brown actually just had a bit of a uh, fight, and then. They went out and, and won game three, so it doesn't really matter. Um, also, Gordon Hayward is not allowed to leave the bubble to see his son, which is kind of sad because the NBA bubble. Of course, St- Stefano's here and not really knowing. So Gordon Hayward's a, uh, a player in the Boston Celtics who unfortunately cannot see his son because he returned to the lineup in game three after a knee injury and had a relatively good game, but for the birth of his son... He is not getting exemption to leave the bubble and come back. Um, I don't know why. It's probably just due to obviously COVID nineteen concerns, but maybe it's a hot spot area, right? But he is not allowed to see his son, so you'll have to play while the birth of his son is happening. Well, that's sad. No one likes to yeah see that. Yeah. So you know turmoil in the Boston Celtics land. Just as they're getting good and they start winning, then news drops. I'm sure that scrap in their locker room was Uh, super technical. Oh yeah, you know like (laughs) sure. Yeah, Marcus Smart trapped a hand, hit him with an overhand left. Uh, Yeah, no. Pulled up, uh, pulled yeah, single sure. leg X guard and attacked a heel hook. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure yeah. they were straight out of Tekken. Uh, <laughs> Miami and six. Uh, Celtics, thank you for making us look like like you had all that fight against the Raptors and then completely fall the wheels completely fall off the rails. And when you see the Miami Heat and Jimmy Butler, so I guess just like fighting basketball also is a matchups game, but. That was, yeah, Miami and six, and uh, I guess that's pretty sad for Gordon Hayward, yeah. Yeah. So. Um. Anyway. Oh, there was a. Sorry, top rank boxing. Oh yeah, top rank. So sorry. sorry let, let, let me let me do the over to our uh, box, boxing correspondent Jeremy Asif. It really wasn't a big weekend, but uh, two good fighters. You know, Jose. Canseco. Jose, don't do that to me because there's like 20 different Jose's in there. But Jose um, Pedraza, Jose Pedraza. Oh, I love uh, I love Jose Pedraza. Yeah, he's good. Jose yeah. Pedraza, he's faced a lot of good competition and uh, went up against um, Javier Molina and uh, was the the experience was he beat he beat Javier Molina and the experience was very showing in this match he let him walk in stand right in front of him and pieced him up the entire fight getting the unanimous decision so he uh he he did well uh outclassed him for sure shout out to uh javier molina for you know at least staying in there and uh at least you know in a lot of fights you see guys just give up and uh just you know a lot a lot of pacquiao game. fights were like that where pacquiao yeah. would would be lying a guy yeah. for about there were the four com- rounds there were the and, pacquiao and, uh comparisons for sure yeah yeah there was a, you know where pacquiao would be laying somebody up for a because Petraza is quick as a hiccup yeah. right um he didn't prove it against t farmer but yeah. that's another story for another time but you know Pacquiao would light somebody up for about four rounds, and in the next four rounds, they're just trying to find a way out. Yeah, but, like, for Molina, you saw that, like, he uh, kept trying to land stuff. He kept trying to work his offense. But, I mean, Pedraza got the decision, and he has his eyes set on the winner of the Ramirez versus Josh Taylor fight. Or if that doesn't happen, then I think he wants a rematch against Jose Espada. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Where the hell is T. Farmer? Because T was trying to get a match with Terrence Crawford so, for so long, and it hasn't happened. Uh, I don't know, man. Like, because he's probably the best defensive boxer in the division. No. Uh, who runs? I mean, oh, uh, you're talking about uh, Crawford or uh, Farmer? Farmer. Farmer. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think it's uh. It's one of those deals where uh, Bob Arum is just. Uh, I think it's. It makes more sense for uh, Crawford to like stay away from that fight. Mm-hmm. So uh, I mean, I'm not too sure about that. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of politics in boxing, so there's a lot of reason why you don't see the fights so, that so you want to see. So it's probably going to be Crawford and Lomachenko, but like I, I I'm just Lomachenko has a fight against uh, Garcia coming up. Yeah, it's yeah. very soon. So, yeah. and I think. Uh, uh, 
both the Charlos are fighting next Saturday too. Oh, yeah. Okay. oh yeah, that's the uh, the double Charlo card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I love how they promote the bo- those Charlos together because they're, they're well, yeah. I mean, but they're scary fighters, you know, like just fast, fast, powerful middleweights, like. But would it kill them to have some head movement, though? Would it? You know? I haven't seen much of the Charlo brothers. So you I know what? I don't think you need head movement in boxing. Wait, hey, when, wait, 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 wait. Let me finish. Let me when cut you, you off right there. When Jim. you have, when you have, when you, when you use spacing so effectively like the Charlos do. No, you absolutely need head movement in boxing. <laughs> no, no, no. But they're so quick. They can get in and out. They don't need to. It's kind of like what, um, it's kind of like what Sean Porter does. Sean Porter doesn't really move his head too much, but he's just his volume and his speed, uh, the the speed and timing of his of his combos. He gets in and out. Like, of course, you need head movement. I mean, I'm not, I'm not like delusional to that fact, but I'm saying like, will you really, if will you realistically get hit if somebody can't see you because you're pressuring them so much and then you get out of there? It could happen because pressure. I mean, I haven't seen much of the Charlo brothers, but yeah. Pressure does make you vulnerable to being hit. The more pressure you apply, generally, okay. generally, the more available you are to be hit. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I can't really. I mean, because too uh, much of the Charlo brothers. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll I'll definitely consider that theory next time I watch, especially with this uh, weekend fight coming up. So I'll definitely keep that. Is in he? Mind. Fa- I'll, I'll be honest though. He's fading some. Uh, no, yeah, I don't. I don't think it's. Yeah, a, I don't like, think it's gonna be. A I think it's he's gonna outclass him as well. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. yeah. Uh, the Charlos, but anyway, all right. Oh yeah, both of them. We had a uh, we had a bit of a card this weekend. Yeah, bit of a maybe the on paper best uh, free card in UFC history, or at least in this ESPN era. And I think largely it delivered. I was uh, mm-hmm. I, I was thoroughly impressed with yeah. a lot of that card. Although it was very entertaining. Although you know, um, you know, my, maybe my politics are coming up, but I was really saddened by the main event. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, <laughs> It was not a good time to have a BLM supporter versus <laughs> Lewis, oh, man. Lewis versus um, Kobe Covington. Man, and uh, just listening to him to, at, at the press conference, it's just – there's definitely, you know, simple-minded individuals listening along to this just like, yeah, he's right. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, it, you know, I, look, I don't want to – I. You know, I'll be honest. I kind of hate the fact that sometimes we do talk like really deep politics because like it takes away from what – you know we are which is an mma podcast right with that being said i'm glad that we do have those conversations because we we need them we need them in and today like today's society especially for good conversation with facts and 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 sometimes they just put our hands up and be like all right uh we don't know what we're talking about but you know we we still can in a time like this i think you can't especially avoid it yeah you can't avoid talking about it Yeah, yeah personally i'm I, th- I think I can be a fan of a fighter and ignore their political views, right? Mm-hmm. Because I'm just – I'm interested in it for the art. I'm interested for the technique. I'm interested in for the spectacle. That's what I'm That's what I'm about. As far as the political views, it's like I do not care politically what any fighter has to say uh, in the sense that I don't get my marching orders from, from, from fighters. Like I'll listen to experts on politics if I want politics. Thank you very much. Right. At the same time – That Dave Chappelle joke, who the beep cares about what da- job we <laughs> thinks? Yeah, yeah, exactly. At the same time – I do think it's responsible for fighters who believe in something to know to, what they're talking to about. know what they're talking about and to use their pulpit responsibly, mm-hmm. right? And to represent the causes that they feel passionate about once they do get a little bit of power. But um, I mean, what do you guys think about the matchup itself? Okay, so or the fight itself, I should say. So you know what? I actually thought Tyron Woolley was doing okay until the third. Better than I expected. Yeah. And the pressure, mm. Kobe seemed to, uh, I don't know if it's just a new approach to the game, to his game, or if it's... Uh, Tyrone uh, Woolley stuff stifling him a little bit? Yeah, because, you know, when when because they have trained together in the past, and when, when certain fighters have trained, you know this very well, mm. when you train with someone over extended periods of time, almost it develops like certain themes, certain patterns uh, that happen... Um, in those matches that will influence a fight, right? You've seen this uh, play out before. Whereas if I fought someone that I've never fought before, I don't know anything about their game. I'm going to be more, um, less reluctant to play my A game because they don't know what it is. So my A game is going to be more likely to work. I don't know what the case was, but to me, Kobe looked a bit... Tentative. Yeah. Tentative. Yeah. Maybe yeah. he's been cracked by that power right hand in training in the past. 
But um, his ta- his reactive takedowns, man, were just were beautiful. That was one aspect. Yeah, round one, I th- I think that really showed it because Tyron Woodley really looked like he was coming out and was really kind of trying to put a big game plan on. He came in with that double jab. Um, that stutter step you used to see back in the day was back. Yes. Um, all, and then all the old band members were back and they were playing their old hits. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he throws a power right, grazes Colby just a little bit, but not enough to stop Colby from a power double takedown. Yes. And he gets it. And Tyron, to his credit, gets right back up. But that's when you saw Tyron get a little gun shy. Mm. And um, Colby, look, again. You know, stylistically, his technical punching. Look, I, I always say it. He couldn't knock out. Uh, he, he couldn't knock out a butterfly um, up against a concrete wall. But <laughs> he is an athletic guy, and you do see it. And and you saw that he could throw. He threw some good kicks to the body, some solid kicks to the body um, that Tyron was not really picking up on. He has a. I saw a scissor kick. I, you know, in yeah. one instance, yeah, I um, I saw a great kind of he would do a rolling, he would do a roll into an overhand right, um, overhand left because he was southpaw for a, a portion of the fight. Um, he was switching stances. You know, he was doing a lot of good things. Now, were they, were they the most like? Look, if it was Jorge Masvidal and he hit some of those body kicks, this is a different story, in my opinion. I think he would have had him out in the second, but. It was, if, if if Tyron, sorry, if Kobe hit some body kicks on Jorge Masvidal, no, like, sorry, if Jorge Masvidal was because Jorge Masvidal's got a great body kick, or yeah, Jorge's got a phenomenal body kick. So if that's Jorge Masvidal throwing those body kicks, that's a this is not Tyron's not going into the fifth, but yeah, you know they were cumulative, and I think I'm not saying it's the reason why Tyron's rib broke, but hey, who's to say? Because um, from what I've heard. Obviously, there's still news coming out about this. Uh, we all looked at the picture before of, of, of Ty- the X-ray of Tyron Woodley's rib, and it's it's disgusting. It's not like a small fracture. Mm. What his lib- rib is literally broken into two pieces. This is one of those one of those um, breaks where it can be pressing up against your organs. And he said it's one of the most painful things he's ever experienced, or the most. And he kept fighting through it. Yeah. So I think I mean we can't yet pinpoint the moment where it happened we might be able to but you have to think that the body kicks had something to do with it i think tyron woodley also just to actually no it wouldn't have had something to do with it because kobe kept hitting it on the right side it was the left rib am i wrong i'm not entirely sure but then again um i was just gonna say i think tyron actually hit some cool counter kicks as well yeah a few times just once or twice where i'm like damn why haven't we seen this before where kobe would throw and retract the leg and then like very traditional Muay Thai stuff, and as he was landing, Tyron would throw a kick back, and you could clear, you could see it clearly troubled Kobe. But I don't know, man. Yeah, it, that's the thing. Like there was a couple times where you know the band members are back and they were going yeah. on the road, and then they would they would stop and postpone a couple dates. <laughs> yeah, <You know? laughs> yeah. I don't know. I was prepared to come in here and say Tyron Woodley looked like his mind was somewhere else, but after I saw that rib injury, it changed everything. I mean. Uh, but even still, uh, I still thought uh, I would give flowers to Woodley because, you know, he 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 looked like he was getting ready. He was gonna finish the fight, and also with the same thing as Molina, like he also looked like he was trying to work on his offense too. Granted, I thought like his mind was somewhere else based on his facial expressions. I don't know if you guys saw that too for Tyron? me. Yeah. I, I would say I at the fourth. Yeah, yeah. Like that's, that's kind of the way he, his face looks like after like a, a tough round, a tough round. Yeah. But he also um, gets gassed out quickly. Right. Yeah. I was, I was even saying it with the boys when we were, we were watching the fight was that. And grab my water. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I, I was saying with the boys that Tyron tends to fade after the third. Yeah. Especially in, when you put pressure on him. Right. Mm-hmm. I thought in this fight, one thing that, um, gave me a bit of confidence in his performance was that he didn't spend as much time up against the fence as he usually does. He spent more time in open air. And maybe that's why Kobe was uh, able, you know, I'm going to have to watch it back. I'm going to be honest with you. But I think that maybe that had something to do with uh, Kobe's lack of, not lack of volume, but decreased volume. Uh, his ability to fight a little bit more in open air. It's just, I don't want to become Mr. Mr. Call it a career over here, but I, I mean, I everyone else is. So. In, in yep. a, yeah, in a, as much as I think it was, 
a valiant enough performance where we saw some offensive ty uh, from Tyron, Tyron Woodley. He didn't look dead in the water, right? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, but you got to look at the division he's in. And now after a catastrophic injury like this rib break, um, I don't know. 38 years I'm, old. 30 All right, so let old. me ask you, what's the difference between a Tyron Woodley and uh, Donald Cerrone? Well, I think Donald Cerrone should retire, too. But... <laughs> I, I completely agree. Because <laughs> um, but... everyone's rooting for Donald Cerrone to keep it pushing. Or and maybe not everyone, but like the aura around Donald Cerrone is, man, if you want to keep fighting, yeah. keep fighting. I, I, think, I think Donald Cerrone, and I don't view it this way, I personally think he should call it a career because he's done great things and it's time to hang it up. I think the reason people are like, yeah, you know, Donald Cerrone, keep doing your thing, is the way he's been able to frame it. He, for Cerrone frames his career as, look, I'm just trying, I just love fighting. I just love it. Win or lose or, or draw, I love fighting. Mm. So he puts off, whereas with Woodley, there's this air aura of like, Prestige. Of prestige around him. Like I get that too. And, and now there's kind of this aura of like, he'll never be able to reach the heights that he once was at. Where yeah. um, I'd argue with Cerrone on a five fight losing streak. Sorry, four fight, one draw now. Clearly not the. At the level of. But Cerrone is, Cerrone is visibly decreasing. Yeah, as is Woodley. Did, yeah. So I, I would say that they're. It's a perfect one-to-one -one comparison. I just think the way in which Cerrone's marketed himself, mm -hmm. I would say that Cerrone, if anything, probably should retire more immediately than Tyron Woodley. I think he's taken more punishment. Well, over the I think I, I also think it's a stylistic thing, is because Cerrone's kind of known for volume, especially as the rounds go on and mm. fun fights, and and he's still doing that to an extent, right? Whereas with Tyron Woodley, he's known for being a counter fighter, accurate, will hit you with a blast double, and yes. you know amazing power but he's also kind of great defensively and we're not see especially with when it came to takedown defense and we're not seeing the, the that level of takedown defense like it used to be or now, takedown offense for that matter or takedown offense um you know tyron woolley believe it or not had the highest percentage of takedown defense in the ufc before heading into tonight i believe it right he would kobe landed what was he three of six last mm -hmm. night mm -hmm. so you know this is this is um, you know, when when a guy who's defensive all of a sudden is slipping up, it's a lot more visible. Look at Anderson Silva. Look at um, – what's his name? Roy McDonald. Look at what – you know, it's it's a lot more visible. I mean, I wouldn't say – I wouldn't I – would, I would – I agree that it is very visible when defensively sound fighters and fighters who we put up on pedestals are, uh, slip up because – for Anderson Silva, you know, we're used to God tier Anderson Silva. We're <laughs> yeah. used to we're used to him yeah. just he he's the man who can't be touched. He's a ghost, and now he looks human, right? Yeah. But I would say that with Cerrone, it's equally as visible because the man's being finished. He's taking terrible beatings. Yeah. Um, I just think it's how he frames it, man. Yeah. I really no, do. that that's fair. Like I I really see your point. I was just saying, like it, it it could be another thing where it's like a stylistic thing where Cerrone's known for kind of volume pressure. I'm gonna get hit. I'll hit you back. What do you think about this fight, by the way? A, oh. a draw. First of all, I thought the result was ridiculous. A draw. I, I one judge gave three rounds to Cerrone. Like, I think here's here's what I think happened. Here's what I think happened. I think somebody. I think it was two rounds to one for Nico, but because the eye poke, you have to give a point away. You have to. Did they deduct a point? I'm ninety percent sure they did. Okay. Um, I would have to go back, but. They, he poked the eye twice, and I think they gave away a point. And and for the record, eye, eye pokes are starting to become a huge problem because a lot of guys are doing the post and retreat in MMA. Yes. Um, and because of that, right, no one's going to – you're not going to see anyone do the um, – the, uh, you know? Long, Muay Thai long guard, yeah. Yeah, no, Muay Thai long guard because the gloves are, are, are open, right? So what you're seeing is a lot of guys – oh, my God, people are going to see my ashy hands. I, I forgot to, to lotion them. But you're going to see this. You guys right? are both looking kind of ashy today. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. That is incorrect. My skin looks beautiful I, You right know, it's now. crazy. I have, I have <laughs> lotion in my bag. So like, so I, do I, I. That's yeah. why I know my skin looks yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, you, no. guys, you guys can be ashy. I can be ashy garami because my leg locks are insane. <laughs> <laughs> I get some lotion. So well, 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 up the leg locks. Well, well, Mike's gone. I'll just quickly talk about a couple of things I did like from Cerrone. Okay. As a fan of grappling, man, that back take was gorgeous. I think he attempted, uh, I forget exactly what he shot in with, but he managed to get Nico Price's hands to the floor. I think it was. It might have been uh, a double leg attempt. And as Price defended and tried to, to turn away, Cerrone was able to uh, drag him forward, force his hands to the mat, and hop up onto that back. 
I, as much as it doesn't make sense and I would never do it myself, I love me when guys uh, jump on that back and pursue that rear naked. Yeah. And I think offensive grappling, if Sorony does want to continue, offensive grappling is definitely something I would love to see him mix in yeah. as opposed to just reactive doubles because he's so great. At, at grappling and to be honest doesn't care whether he's on top or on as back. a as a new mma fan or if you're a casual mma fan and you slowly start to learn the objectives of jujitsu and the certain positions you kind of see how creative some guys are when it comes to their grappling game because of uh when you realize what the objective is it's not just kind of like pin somebody to the ground and try and get punches in or try and uh, isolate an arm or a leg and and yeah. tear it off yeah exactly there's subtlety there's there's yeah. subtlety to it that's lost on a lot of yeah, people who I don't think understand Cerrone it. is kind of like creative like that yeah well what, what do you think about his overall performance guys um and and how, how, what do you think were some of the tools that um Nico Price used that were so effective I, I thought I thought we saw an improved Nico Price I agree with that yeah. what, 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 what what stood out to you uh just the ways he was getting that right hand off um I I you know Set, by the way, my hands are now now not ashy no more. Um, and his, a, his ashy garami still sucks, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I will say hand sanitizer has been a killer for me. That's pro that's like I come back home and my hands are like so dry from the hand sanitizer. You're getting the wrong hand sanitizer, man. You need you, get, you need last the one call. that costs yeah, hand you, sanitizer. You need the last one that straw. costs fifty dollars per one. First little off, bar, it's last bar. straw. Last straw hand sanitizer. You don't need expensive hand sanitizer you need freddie carroll's last straw hand sanitizer right. sorry go on he doesn't sponsor us yet but <laughs> freddie stay tuned give yeah. us some money now <laughs> we did the thing freddie give us money uh but yeah no uh, yes yeah, so you're talking about his uh he was setting up his right hand a little more effectively yeah and and what he was doing was he was he was changing levels with it so um he was he he, he used a good low kick Every once in a while, um, I thought he went away from it in the later rounds, mm -hmm. um, particularly three. But by that point, you're tired. I don't blame you. Right. Um, Whatever's most natural is going to come out, right? Be accentuated when you're tired. Exactly. But um, I just particularly liked uh, every, every once in a while, he would he would throw that jab out as a feint. Um, he had a good left hook going. And then after he was throw that right to stutter, mm -hmm. Donald Cerrone. And in the first round, it was working wonders. Wow. Okay. I wasn't uh, – as a – Broadcaster, I was away from the mic. Rookie mistake. But yeah, he was throwing he was doing a lot of that. And it was working wonders for him in the first round. I thought Cerrone was actually in trouble. In the first round, yes. And another thing I noticed in the first round was that I thought um it, obviously getting on Cerrone fast is always a good idea if you yeah. can catch him cold. But uh working into the clinch and landing uh uppercuts from that single collar tie and and strikes from that clinch was a good move and flirting up against him up against the fence not giving him time to rest yeah, yeah well, this I, is... I, I thought that fight could be could, uh, was going to be finished in the first round credit to Cerrone, Cerrone surviving but yeah. that was interesting but see this is this yeah. is where if if you had to say like one of the big mistakes of Cerrone's career is I would have liked to see him watch a little more film because you're seeing things that are a lot more indicative of yeah this guy's just not watching film sure yeah right um Starting slow was t like, yeah, it could be a Muay Thai thing where, like, you know, they play the da -na 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 thing and you're feeling each other out. And, yeah, the annoying, and, the annoying clarinet music yeah. that, that ruins the, the beautiful right, the Squidward music. Muay Thai. Yeah, the, the Squidward music. Um, no, but like, I think another is is that you're not watching film, you're taking a fight every two weeks, right? And so you don't know what this guy has to start out with. So you are coming in there a little slow because you don't know his good stuff. It would have been nice over Cerrone's career maybe one time two time he watched some film knew what this guy was gonna do and ha and was right for him from the jump he Planned just accordingly yeah. yeah you know what I'm saying he was he's always he just always seemed like the slow starting was more of an account of him not coming in cold to a fight not really knowing what's going on yeah as opposed to like actually like just being An that inability. kind of style yeah yeah well, right um but uh, alas that's not really the thing but the whole point I'm trying to make is that, you know, that's what Nico Price Nico Price took advantage of the slow starting, but he also did some things where it looked like a very much more improved Nico Price. Hmm. I, I I agree. I think he stepped up uh to this matchup and, and brought out some very some very cool tools uh and wasn't deer in the headlights just at the the thought of fighting Cerrone. Um so he I, really I, looks like a stick insect to me, a really jacked walking stick <laughs> insect to me. What Nico Price? He's got that Dorito-shaped torso and those really long limbs. He's just an oddly built guy, but 
evidently he carries power in weird ranges. So, um, did you guys see his reaction after the draw? He was so happy. He was what? so happy just to get the draw. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's I, interesting, man. You know, Dallas Roni just brings out the nice in people. It's, oh, yeah. It's weird, but it's also kind of nice and endearing. It's like it's like fighting, you know. Superman or Spider-Man or something. It's like, oh, you know, I'm with Spider-Man. All the heroes love it, right? So, Yeah, slowly been starting to get uh, familiar with Nico Price. But um, question for you guys, where do you think the future is for this young man? Well, I don't know how young he is. I shouldn't call young man. I mean, I'm, he could be I'm 80 a child. For I'm a child, so. I would let, he has a child. Jeremy is actually 11 years old. That's um, the truth. I'm in my heart. <laughs> Stay away from Jeffrey Epstein. So, <laughs> so you always got to take a left field. You always got to take. You always got to make a left, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, interestingly enough, we've seen that. A, I think Nico Price can be a star, probably not a champion. But I think if the UFC, yeah, you know, I don't see champion. No, I don't no. see champion. I don't see the the technical skill to do that. Um, but. I mean, obviously, he's going to evolve as he did to uh, get the draw with Donald Cerrone. What I think is it would be a good role for him going forward. Um, the UFC could use him as a headliner for fight nights. One of those fighters where you're like, I'm always excited to see Nico Price. Which, mm. If you saw the scrap between him and Vincente Luque in his last one, mm -hmm. it was incredible. It was a great, it was a great back and forth banger. He's willing, both both of them willing to take uh, eat a shot to uh, to deliver one. Um, so. I would uh, book him favorable matchups, keep him away from wrestlers, and uh, have some fun. Let's have some fun with Nico Price. Well, the crazy thing with him is that, like, you know, this isn't Nate Diaz or something like that. This guy can defend a takedown, you know, so well, it's that's not— an interesting matchup idea, Nate Diaz oh, versus Nico Price. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I would like to see that. Yeah, but, you know, my whole thing is is that he can— Price isn't necessarily— he has jujitsu. Yeah, he's offensive jujitsu. He has good jujitsu. He's not a hor he's not Gerald Mearshart when it comes to wrestling. And um, oh we'll get we'll get to Gerald Mearshart in a second. Um and you know, he it does seem like he can be competitive against a lot of guys in that top fifteen of the Walterweight division. It's just that, you know, he the technical aspects of his striking really hold him back. But he's willing to bang and he's got an excellent chin. And he generates a lot of power in a lot of weird spots. A weird spots, which makes him dangerous for anyone. Like m m one of the craziest knockouts of his for me, and I was, said this before, um, the pod, uh, the, the podcast, podcast, the preview podcast, was the uh, the Kevin, the, not Kevin Holland, Randy Brown, Randy Brown, and we'll get to Kevin Holland too, I guess. Man, but. from like a reverse knee shield, he just threw some hammer fists and knocked him out from the bottom. Just bizarre, bizarre stuff. Yeah. Um, Oh, no one sees. No one's seeing what I'm doing now. This is this is this is Nico Price. Not excellent, me. excellent, Mike. Thank you. Yes, uh, we'll yes. put that one up on the fridge. So <laughs> let's, if you guys don't mind, because I'm excited to talk about this next one, because there's some big implications for what could be happening next. Dude, I was oh. Do not doubt the hype train. The hype train is coming for you. Man, 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 man. Okay. Um, I was okay. So, spoiler: everyone knows this. We have a we have a Google Drive, and I put a lot of my scripts for my short videos on Google Drive. And I was gonna make a Hamza Shemaev. Is it time? Like, are we losing our minds? Because they oh. double booked him. Remember, they double booked him, and I was like, hold on a second. What are we doing? Yeah. <laughs> right. So in comes the fight, right? And and Hamza Shemaev comes out and Joe Mirshar comes so, out. Um, Hamza actually touches gloves. Like, he actually initiates the glove touch. And considering the fact that a lot of the, uh, both of these guys were very, very mad at each other coming into this match, I didn't think that was going to happen. I thought they were just going to come out and start swinging. But I thought it was something. over before it started. I, I could see that. I could see that. I, I, that's on one of the, the few press times, conference, yeah. the, I feel like he got in his head. Yeah, that was one of the few times I was like, okay, no, this is definitely because he 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 had real estate in his head. No, no, hear me out on this, uh, because you guys are gonna get mad at me for this. I still, as impressive as that was, I don't think we've really learned that much about Kamzat, except that he has KO power in his hands. I don't think technically we can really judge whether he's necessarily. Uh, worthy of being a top ten, top fifteen fighter. I and feel I, like reason, we learned. The, the reason being is. Um, 
Mirshart backed him di- self directly. Uh, comes up th- through a couple of kicks. Uh-huh. Mirshart backed himself directly onto the fence, and then comes out just through a uh, a jab cross. And Mirshart's hands came down. He's, I, I he's thought stuck, it was just a straight right. I, I don't even think. I don't, I don't think there was any kicks credit. either. It, it, I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, any that's kicks what I'm saying. I, I saw one kick. There were kicks. No, there was two kicks. kicks. There were two kicks. kicks. That's so. All I'm saying was not much date. Not much. Not much. Not many lessons to be learned from this. We didn't see him, you know, having to overcome technical problems with with creative solutions. Nothing like that. It was an impressive performance for me, and I'm not taking anything away from him. I thought it was. I thought it was sick, and I lost my. mind. I mean, how how many more create? How creative can you get in 17 seconds? That's that's, that's what I'm saying. I'm not. I'm not saying I didn't like it. I'm not saying it's not impressive, and I'm not saying I don't want to see more of Kamzat Chamayev, which is all true. All I'm saying is, um, let's let's not uh, hyperbolize and say things like Ariel Hawani did earlier, like, you know, this man belongs in the top ten. You know, I've been saying it. I'll say it again. He belongs in the top ten. We don't really know that yet. I'm not going to say he doesn't, but like, I'll, uh, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll, I, no disrespect to the analysis mind of Stefano Hosko, but. Uh, bun that I'm gonna hyperbolize all day long. Friggin, I think it's I think it's about time to get on the hype train. Uh, dude, I feel like that was so tactical. I don't really even see like it was all tactical. Like from my understanding of it, I feel like okay, let me wait on the outside. Well, well let me let me kind of circular into a snake into the back uh, of the cage, and then like let me lead you into this right hand. He kind of did the opposite. Of what Jose um, McGregor did, you Jose Pe- Pe- Pedraza oh, did. Pedraza bad. would wait for Molina to get in his in his uh, range and then piece him up while he kind of led him into that right hand. And then I said in the group chat, "Rock my baby <laughs> in the treetop." Boom. Good night. Like that was so. It was so beautiful. Honestly, for me, it was beautiful to watch. Well, see, that's, I, I, I agree. thought it was beautiful. I agree. I, this is this is my thing, though. Oh, sorry, man. Go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say really quickly. I agree, and I I think you know there's something beautiful to a nice crisp one two being landed. Beautiful. But at the same time, I think Mearshart in a lot of ways. Yeah. Gave didn't away that, do it to himself. He, 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 gave, he, away that, he, he gave away that fight because even if Kamzat were, were, were to have come in here with a grappling heavy uh, game plan, yeah. which is what everyone was anticipating, if you circle the cage um, to the power hand side by and the way. back, yeah, and back yourself onto the cage, mm-hmm. right? Let it's a matter of time. Let Shamayev crowd you. If yeah. he was fighting a grappling heavy game plan, he was going to take you down and speak with you. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I was not too impressed with, impressed with what Mirshart did in those seventeen seconds. You mean? But I, I, I want to. No, no, Oh, yeah. Oh, his. I was you're impressed. Not... I was very impressed with Chamayev. Don't get me wrong. Oh, well, okay, okay. okay. I, I so let me, say, let me ask I, you. A I would like on the hype train as well. I just, I'm just holding off before. Ba- you staying... want the back seat? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Don't yeah. Tell I want the, I want the seat next to the exit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't, don't you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm ready to leap off at any time. Don't, don't you tell me he's a top ten, uh, Ariel Hawani. Don't you dare. Right, I, I I switched the camera before you looked at the camera. If you want to do that again, Mr. Ariel Hawani, sir, Canadian MMA journalist legend, don't you dare tell me that he's a top ten. Okay. And also, Luke Thomas is coming for you, bud. <laughs> you know they don't like each other, apparently. I I'm very well aware. That's why yeah. I said. <laughs> um. Okay. Okay. Fine. Let, let let me let me ask you guys a question, and I'm being a little rhetorical with this because you can look at it in two ways with the striking. It's either A, Hamza used excellent footwork, sneaky good footwork to cut off the cage. Yeah. I'd like to rewatch it. For, yeah, force force Joe Mishar into the power hand mm-hmm. side and then through this through this cross, but did in the way where he flared out the elbow to trick Mishar's eyes into thinking he was going to throw a hook. I, I agree with and, that. That was nice. Yeah. That was nice. And you- because you could see it, he it's like a pump, he pumped and then through, yeah. right? And so that's that's technical in its own right, and that's tactical, one shot, one kill. Or or you could say this, where everyone knows. The first thing – I, Jeremy, me and you, we box. What's the first thing I say about footwork? Don't walk to the lead, to the power hand side. Mm-hmm. Yep. Don't right. walk to the power hand side. Yeah, and, and, and just, just to preface that, you can sometimes, but you can't continually move in the same direction. Like, that's the thing. I think I think you're onto something because I don't think it's one or the other. 
I think it's both of what you just said because we did see those tricks from from Chimaev. I agree that that was those were some nice little details you pointed out there. At the same time, yeah, just circling in the same direction. You, are you going to see high level fighters in the UFC back themselves onto the cage and just circle along the cage in the same direction? You know. Yeah. Yeah, that and, and yeah, not just did, not just yeah. same direction, power hand, power hand. side, like and and and, and the a little and, fake in one and one direction and switch yeah, to the other. And, and and here's the thing too, Mirshart's a southpaw. He should know better. This is what you do. This is all you oh, most yeah, of the time well, you're facing right handed. I people. watched it like three times because I could. Thank you for making it short and brief. <laughs> I watched. I'm like, why is he still going to that? He's baiting you. I'm like, the, each time I would watch, I'd be like, he's baiting you. Like, why would you keep going? Back like you that. know what's funny? That's we, why I say it's over. But it was over before it we, started. We, we've talked about this fight for significantly longer than the duration of the fight. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's true. And and and, but like my thing is, is that like, yeah, I guess you can on one hand be like, ah, I don't know if he's right for Maya yet. But on the other, you know, I, he yeah. did some things there where I'm like, Damian Maya is not going to be able to to handle that, right? Uh, yeah, the, the the one thing that uh, gave me. Um, made the Maya matchup a little more intriguing was that Chemayev, if he is able to keep it on the feet, can actually damage Maya. So that was interesting. The reason why I don't like the Maya matchup is because one of two things is going to happen. And this is Maya's final fight, I believe. Either Damian Maya, uh, old school legend, is going to get a violent send-off and be knocked out in his, in his last fight uh, or receive a horrible beating, which I don't want to see as a big Damian Maya fan. Or... You're going to crush this prospect before he even gets going. And right off into the sunset while you do it. Yeah. So, I mean. I would be upset with that. Crushing the prospect? No. I, I, I feel like it's. I feel like that, well, that's I think, how I you know. Think, like I, I'm saying it's, I think it's a lose lose situation. Well, I think already. UFC? Well, for. for I me think. Personally, I think. I'm just. I'm just saying. Oh, okay. I mean. Well, I think already, though, the legend of Hamsai has been. You know the talk of the town, and for nothing else, yeah. uh, MMA on point is going to make a top ten list about about top what? ten things Hamza Chimayev did when he was young and you know, <laughs> but <MMA on> point. <laughs> man, don't diss him. I, I like him. They're okay. Top fifteen MMA moments where fighters were sweaty on the on the stool <laughs> and didn't like it. Um, <laughs> no, but like you know, already you know he's at this this legend. Uh, of Hamza, this epic of Hamza is something that you could tell people if you're like that. That sounds like that sounds like an actual like m mythological story. The epic of Hamza. <laughs> I'd read that. You know, uh, Sinbad in the Seven Seas. No, okay. Uh, <laughs> but you know, seriously, like that, he comes hey, in. Name of the podcast: The Epic of Hamza. The Epic of Hamza. As the Hamza turns, you know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, seriously, like he's already kind of had the the. the Two wins in, what was it, like 11 days or something stupid like that? Now it's three wins in 66 days. Yeah, three wins in 66 days. Um, takes out two guys and, and has it really given up less than five. You can count one hand how many significant strikes he's taken. I think in the first two fights, he absorbed like three strikes or something It was like two. That. I saw two. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And and two were against John Phillips off of John Phillips's back. Yeah, they were like nothing strikes. Yeah, they were, they, like, I, to call him significant is a joke. It's not, it, it's not true. Um. Yeah. I but yeah. Hey, by the way, speaking of first round blowouts, man, Johnny Walker versus Ryan Span. Yeah. Sloppy. Uh, the, all this fight did for me was a get me to realize light heavyweight has a huge drop off in talent outside of the top five, and number two. Really? Just, you think so? This was sloppy. But like, not I mean, not top five though. Like, he, absolutely I, top five. I, I, dude, when I was watching this fight, I'm like, congratulations, you killed two potential prospects because I'm not really interested in either of them anymore. Man, Johnny Walker just looked so defensively porous, getting caught on What, what did I say, though? What did I say? Oh, geez. We're what did I say? We're already on the Johnny Walker fight, do we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that was the next one. I mean... Oh, okay. I okay, thought you, okay, you skipped over let's... the Mackenzie Dern No, that's coming up. No, okay, so... All right. Can we... Can we let me go back on Hamzat, though. Time's up versus Damian Maya. Are we okay with it now, or um, I, I'm okay with it. I just personally don't like it. I'd like to see him against um, maybe a top twenty opponent in kind of like an interesting fight. Or if you're going to do a, um, a like a top ten opponent like a Maya, I'd like to see someone where I don't know, man. It, it's either going to be a win for for a quick. I'd like to see it advance. The other guy's career a little more if he can beat Hamza Chimaev. I'd like to, instead of just 
potentially seeing Damian Maya take a beating in his last fight or vice versa, mm. killing mm. a prospect. I don't know. What do you guys think? I, I I'm I'm here for it. I'm yeah. I'm here for it. I mean, I'm look, here for all the day, the Hamza Shamaya fights. I'm I'm here for it. I, is, I'm, I'll be honest. This is my chance to uh, get on a Khabib type fighter, and if he blows up, then I'll be like, hey, I was there from the beginning. I'm like with Khabib. Yeah, <laughs> w- w- with Khabib, it's funny because in his early days, man, I remember people were just not particularly excited. Yeah, as he was tearing through. Lightning. Yeah, but now you that he's but weird? now that he's like set like this whole like mystique about himself people are looking for the next khabib just yeah. like how i guess people were kind of looking for the next silva the next gsp the next mcgregor exactly rory mcdonald was actually supposed to be the next gsp yeah yeah, yeah. did a, had a damn good job he, he had he had a he had a, you know what the thing is this He's is PFL this now, by the way. yeah this is this is this goes to show you just how good robbie lawler was when robbie lawler was robbie lawler yeah like, you know and but anyway um, yeah, no, I'm here for that that Hamza fight, man. I'm but telling you, Johnny Walker. So <laughs> yeah, no, okay. See, but what did I say? What did I say? We were on here this podcast, and I said you were right. Yeah, right. Now I said porous, and I was like, all right, I'll take that back. But now I'm done. Now porous is starting right. to seem a little accurate. I mean, dude, just sloppy, sloppy MMA. Just getting caught on one leg, getting caught throwing a right hand with a counter. Just, just sloppy, reckless fighting, and then Span gets caught at the end from a defended takedown with hammer fists and and elbows from that but it's just i don't know man it was it was it was a slug fest i'll give it that but it didn't give me confidence that either of these men can be well, uh, prospects one day here here's the th- here's the deal um or not prospects can be contenders one day yeah well here's the deal ja- um jack Hermanson is like this too where it's the striking what gets people with the striking although giant walker's a lot more offensively like he's got more a lot more skills in the tank offensively but what gets people is movement and wild strikes mm. they're awkward you know what i'm saying yeah um now john Wa- johnny walker is a much more of an athlete so it's weird to call him awkward but he's more gumby right and he definitely it, is awkward yeah he's awkward and that's what gets people and there's look it's okay to be awkward but i would like to see some fundamentals and the thing about sure. it is you're not seeing defensive responsibility no you're not seeing offensive um tact you're not seeing distance management for that rather and this guy's what is he six five six six yeah six five he yeah man i for all intents and purposes he could be remembered like a houston alexander a guy who was able to who had physical gifts and threw some wild stuff that threw people off just based on its unorthodox nature but ultimately struggled to maintain success once guys kind of figured him out a little bit and you know, but I, I, that's it's sad because I was really excited for the Johnny Walker hype train. Yeah, I was all on that train. I, I, I was the conductor of that train. I, I, I was, was on it was, after the uh, the Sirkinov Sirkinov fight. Yeah. Me too, man. I, because Misha, you know, Canadian legend. I was I was shoveling coal into the train, <laughs> like I was that guy. But alas, it was not meant to be. I, guys, I actually realized I might have to call it. Yeah, I might have to get out of here. All right, all right, all right. Um, Are we going to go over the rest of the card? I guess we'll go over the rest of the card. Hey, all I got to say is Mackenzie Dern throwing up that, that arm bar while her leg was still trapped in uh, in half guard. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Well, I will say, um, you know, uh, goodbye, Stefano, if you got to go. Yeah, Stefano. Yeah. Guys, um, in this crazy messed up time where – Okay. We have technical all difficulties right, and, right, and Stefano right. has to – hold on. And Stefano has to leave the <laughs> podcast early. You have three things. You have Michael, you have David, and you have Jeremy. Good night, everybody. All right. All right. Get out of here. All right, man. All right. T- peace. You know what? While I'll do too is like while, while uh, I I'll, I'll move the, Jeremy, the camera so that people can see Jeremy a little bit. You know more. what? No, because I'm just going to take his seat because he actually has a better seat. All right. Cool, cool. Uh, um, but, yeah. Uh, Mackenzie Durham versus Ronda Marcos. And, and this was interesting to me because um, Durham versus Marcos was. Michael on this uh, oh, sorry. The highlights on. This is mostly going to be. Oh, you got it. Yeah, Good. Yeah, yeah. This is mostly going to be Michael on this because I just watched the highlights of this fight. Enjoyed them, but I was more interested in the main fights. Um. Yeah. No. Okay. So I, I, I'll say this. I'll say this. Uh, Marcos tactical error i would say you don't want to go with a bjj She's canadian champion. right yeah okay you don't want to go with a bjj uh world champion my notebook in here? Uh, um good sir good sir you're interrupting our podcast excuse me excuse me i hijacked the podcast
<laughs> who is this guy? Who, who is this guy? Security? <laughs> um, but, but yeah, no, I, I tactical error, I think, on, on the part of Ronda Marcos. I think, um, you know, Mackenzie Dern falls, right? She, she trips and falls on a mm-hmm. kick. Marcos, you know, you, you probably don't want to want to go on the ground with a BJJ world champion who's known for their insane guard. When I watch her fight, she 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 tends to be a, a tad bit aggressive. Well, no, she's slow. Who? Dirt? Marcos. Marcos. Yeah. yeah no, I I said, and, I said go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Makes poor, not aggressive, but makes poor decisions. She she does. Um, she look. She's hooks and body locks. That's why I say. But I wouldn't say poor decision. I just say that she's wild, right? She's mm-hmm. aggressive, right? Mm-hmm. Um, she presses, and that's her game, right? Short hooks, body locks. Get the takedown. But, you know, like Stefano said, what do you do with that style when um, you you meet someone who's got a significant jujitsu advantage against you? Um, and it's not like Marcos can't go to the ground and isn't a solid grappler. But, you know, Mackenzie Dern's a world champion, like probably one of the greatest BJJ um, players, at least oh, female BJJ players of all time. Yeah. Right? And, you know... You get Mackenzie. So when Mackenzie Dern is on the floor, mm-hmm. conventional wisdom would to say, "Don't follow her on the floor. Under mm-hmm. no circumstances do you follow her on the floor, right? Um, you you use your hands, you know. And you know, it's not to say Mackenzie Dern isn't um, a good striker or isn't like a, a straw weight, isn't a capable striker at straw weight, but the the lesser of two evils is the stand up. Right. So when Mackenzie Dern falls to the floor after a kick, yeah, Ronda Marcos makes her job incredibly easier. Easy yeah, by following her, and so this is where I go tactical error. Yep, right there. Yeah, right. And so, and, and this is where I say tactical errors. Um, what do you call it? Tactical errors is a lot of times why people get submitted and lose fights. More so than it is a skill difference in the UFC, because in the UFC, everyone can fight. Everyone mm. can grapple. Everyone gets to take down defense. Everyone can do things, right? Um, you know, and for Ronda, R- Randa, or Ronda, it, it's Randa. For Randa, it was a tactical error. Oh, Randa. Okay. Yeah, it's Randa. Like, it's R-A-N-D-A. It's Randa. But, yeah, I don't know. Let, what's your thoughts on the fight? Um, I just thought it was, uh, uh, you know, not upsetting, but I just, you know, it was disappointing. You know, obviously you want to see the Canadian win. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, what, the, what weight class was this? Uh, straw weight at 115. Yeah. I mean, like there's other straw weights I'd rather see fight, but I, I do enjoy Mackenzie Dern fights. Um, you know, very talented. I, I, I just, uh. I I, I this was, uh, wasn't the result I wanted. This was one of the fights where I had a, a, a horse in the race yeah. or a dog in the race. So yeah, but, uh, you yeah. know it was enjoyable. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, moving on, let's talk about the first fight. I was I was semi excited for this one, Kevin Holland versus Darren Stewart, and yeah, no, I've been I've been a fan of Kevin Holland since the Dana White Contender series. Um, his first matchup that he has at middleweight is Tiago Santos. Oh my! Uh, <laughs> but ever since then, he's kind of not looked back. And this was a um, what do you call it? This is a a a, uh, a matchup where uh, the winner was really the fans, in my opinion. It was a good stylistic matchup, seeing uh, these two go at it, and uh, ultimately Kevin Holland got the split decision nod against. Uh, Darren Stewart, uh, you know, good, 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 solid striking, good display of just MMA, in my opinion. Yeah, I thought uh, this was a good fight. Yeah, 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 it was just a good display. Um, mm-hmm. You know, what were some things that y- you liked about this uh, fight here? Oh, I mean, I just, uh, like a, like myself, I uh, enjoy the striking. I enjoy the striking aspect of mixed martial arts, and I enjoy seeing sh- – uh, responsible defense because myself that's something that i want to work on and get better at so i love watching these guys learning from them and seeing how uh timing and spacing changes when you add the aspect of uh kicking and uh also uh defending takedowns so 
it was um enjoyable fight to watch. I thought that the split decision was fair, but I think um what you were giving it to Stuart? Or uh I think you could make a case for it because of the uh takedowns he was able to land. Mm -hmm. But um I still don't think that dictated the control of the fight. See, and, I think. and and that was the thing. I always say back in the old days of MMA, if you landed a takedown, you could have had that takedown for zero point one seconds. Mm -hmm. If you land that takedown, you've won the round. Yeah. Right? Um What do you think changed the the way judges value takedowns? I I think <sighs> I think it was takedown control. I think it's takedown take control. control. Yeah, right. I, I think agree. it's ground control. That's what's changed time on the, the ground. New era, yeah, kind of, right. I, I think again. I think right when we talked about mirroring analytics for better or for worse, I think this is one of the times where it was for better because it used to be takedown, you've won. But now there's more analytics on takedowns, ground strikes, mm -hmm. total strikes, time of control, clinch control time. You know, a lot of these things are seen. And a lot of these judges have to keep that in mind. Like, well, did he do much? Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not saying Darren, Darren Stewart didn't have good takedowns. Mm -hmm. He had a great – I think he had a great single leg up against the fence, um, if you re recall. So, I, you know, he had some things there. But, you know, it's not – was it enough to get him the nod who against Colin Hull, Kevin Holland, who was definitely the more superior striker in my opinion? Um, I don't think so. Um, but I could definitely see an argument where, you know what, if you want to give it to Stuart, then okay. But mm, yeah, I, yeah. You know, and I don't think any guy's stock was lost in this fight. I, I really do you think, enjoyed it. Do you think, uh, do you think, uh, who do you think had the ring general, who was the general of the cage? Uh, you probably want to say Stuart. You probably, because. You think so? I, yeah, I would, I would say Stuart. Okay. Um, it, it. It was honestly. I think those were. That's the, That was a fifty-fifty in my opinion. Okay. You know, I. I you know, Evenly matched. I. I think it was a fifty-fifty in terms okay. of cage generalship. That's that's a good term. We should use that cage generalship. Yeah, I was about to say ring generalship, but it's a cage. It's not a ring. Yeah, but octagon generalship. Octagon uh, generalship. But yeah, no, I. I think I think it was fifty-fifty because, like, yeah, there were there were moments where, you know, Holland was using effective distance management. Yeah. Um, but there were moments where Stewart was using good pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's weird. It's like not all pressure is good pressure. I truly believe that. Right. Right. So it's it's weird. But I would I would probably give the, give the nod to uh, uh, Stewart to, to to Stewart in that aspect. In that aspect. Yeah. Um, but I still think that in terms of effective striking, which is the number one thing that they look at in MMA. If you look at the judging criteria, the number one thing is effective striking. Right. Right? Um, effective grappling. Right. Octagon control. Right? Sorry. Effective. Yeah. Effective striking, effective grappling, and octagon control. That's right. that's the, you know. Um, and when they say striking, they also mean ground strikes as well, by the way. But that's the criteria. So so octagon control would be what we saw against Shamaya versus Mirasha. Yeah, where, where Shamaya cuts you, that cage off. You're – it, it – it the look of the fight is you're the one who's getting your game plan to work while the other one is struggling. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, but yeah. Uh, you got a take? I know. Do I, we have other? Uh, I just want to talk about uh, a car. Um, um, one of the fights on the prelims. Uh, T.J. Laramie versus Derek Minner, um, or Minor. We I have at it. Minner. Um, you know, T.J. Laramie is a Canadian guy as well. Came from Windsor, Ontario. Um, just like Randa Marcos, and he unfortunately came up short against Derek Minard, 52 seconds into the first round, which is a heartbreaker. But I just want to say it is not an indictment on TJ Laramie as a fighter. Um, I just want to say that, at, like, right here. Um, TJ Laramie, um, if you guys saw him on the Contender Series, really showed out. Uh, good, good striker. Great on the ground. He just got caught. All right, it happens. He got caught um, in in his first match in the UFC, and I really hope, uh, you know, no, but he doesn't lose any stock in this one because uh, TJ Laramie is, uh, you know, a great great fighter. Um, if you had a chance to see his stuff at the Prospect Series, um, Prospect Series, but Prospect uh, Fighting Championships. You know, you'll know that this guy is excellent. So I think I think that we're we're pulling for him. You know, the light kick is pulling for him, and unfortunately, he didn't get the win. But you know, 
50 and, and 52 seconds, I get it, looks bad on paper, but this is, the, I, I, you know, I'm still rooting for the Canadian kid because I think he could do good things and he could, he could represent Canada very well in the, in the near future. Shout out to TJ Laramie. Yeah. Um, you know, Laramie rhymes with Jeremy. <laughs> of course, that's why. Um, Shout out. But yeah, Jeremy's take. Uh, I don't really want to talk about this, but I know we were discussing it earlier in the week. You want to talk about Floyd versus Logan Paul? Sure. Do you have anything on that you want to say? Uh, I mean, I said my piece uh, on the preview show. I said my Oh, piece. you guys talked about it on the preview show? Yeah, oh, okay. I said my piece on it. I mean, I, look. I, I only watched like three quarters of it, which is still a lot. But right. I must, it must have been near the end. Yeah, it was, it was the very end. Look, I, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll say it. I'll, I'll, I'll put it out there and say, say this. I'll say this. Um... I think Logan Paul can be a good fighter. Mm-hmm. I think Logan. I, I'm, I'm going to say it here. I think Logan Paul displayed to me in his amateur fight and pro fight against KSI mm-hmm. that at least for the early rounds he has talent. Mm-hmm. He's got a sneaky fast jab, mm-hmm. right? He's got a good straight right, and he. Can and he understands tactical boxing. Right. I also think that doesn't necessarily mean that you know the game. That just means you know how to follow instructions and you're coachable. Yeah, but it, it could also mean that he's learning. He's got a good feel. Yeah, exactly. For it. That's true too. Right. It, it could mean that he's got a feel for it. I also think that Logan Paul is because he's a credentialed wrestler. If he, if he would like, right? If he would like. And he stays committed to the game and runs and he gets his cardio under control and figures that aspect to his game out as well. Could you're be- talking about MMA, are you? Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I was like, are I, you really going there? Yeah, I really think. I don't know. I'm, a, I'm afraid for it. boxing is boxing. Although guys do get killed in boxing, I think guys probably get killed more in boxing than MMA. But I think MMA is just too dangerous with the aspects of uh, submissions. Well, because wrestling isn't submissions. Wrestling is just takedowns. No, it, it's true, and, and pinning somebody to the ground. I I, yeah. I I understand the idea where it's like, okay, in MMA he might like get real exposed there and, and look mm-hmm. worse. But you yeah. know, again, I I always say this: when he went to go face Paulo, he didn't face him, but when he went to spar and mm-hmm. and train with Paulo Costa, and they sparred, and he knocked and Paulo Costa knocked him out. Mm-hmm. A lot of people were impressed with Logan Paul, and they said his boxing's good. But what they were really impressed with was his grappling. Mm. They were really impressed with his wrestling. Mm-hmm. And that's facing Paulo Costa, who I believe has a BJJ black belt. Don't quote me on that. But he, he does train with a BJJ, with a very high credential BJJ instructor. And is one of the best strikers in the division and a power puncher. And there were some aspects. If you see that tape, there were some aspects where Logan Paul got Paulo Costa a little bit and some hard sparring. So... I'm saying all this is to say this is a roundabout way of saying this. I think Logan Paul, if he were to face some other amateur, I'm talking. I'm not even saying like you know another YouTuber. I'm saying literally another amateur right. who's training right. and doing this just as hard as he is and is a legit killer. I think Logan Paul would actually be very competitive. Look, man, my hate does not go up to Logan Paul. I think this is a good businessman decision. He knows how to make money as a fellow YouTuber. I can't hate on you for making money. Yeah, yeah. It's and just it's, it's my it's it's my qualms with Floyd Mayweather taking this fight. Like, if you're gonna face a YouTuber, why not face KSI, who actually won the fight against the two? And and if it's about the following, I know Logan Paul has a huge following, but KSI also has like can also bring in numbers too. Well, like, we don't know if KSI took it or didn't take it. But, but, but no, my- actually, but even still, though, it was Logan Paul, actually, I, I believe, who reached out to Floyd Mayweather about this fight. And, I mean, Floyd Mayweather's a businessman, but what's another, like, million dollars going to do in your billion-dollar pockets? Like, or it's, I think they they projected it to be around, like, it won't go over $15 million, but anything under or around that neighborhood of $15 million. But the thing is, like... I just would like to see if you want to do it for entertainment value or an exhibition. But even still, this is kind of I, I don't like what this does to uh, his legacy because you have guys like Manny Pacquiao who are still fighting the uh, Keith Thurman's 
and uh, things like that. So it's like you got other guys who are still who are who are who are who are trying to build their but legacy. See, while, that- and I know Floyd is the greatest. Floyd is probably is like one of the greatest, but the greatest defensive boxer in the conversation for greatest boxer of all time. But uh, is this hurting Floyd Mayweather's legacy? Is the real question. Well, he's retired, but see, this is what I was trying to explain: is that like as much as I, I know think he's retired, yeah, yeah, as much as I think Logan Paul can be good mm-hmm. if he like really just he's not going to his... touch Floyd, man. Exactly, it's right? It, it, we but, already it's a foregone hold on, hold on, conclusion. Hold on, let me let me just explain this because I want people to understand what I'm trying to explain. Right. As much as I think Logan Paul has talent and can be a good boxer if he tries and 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 goes up the ranks and and gives it like he can be serviceable, right. and I think he could be a serviceable MMA fighter if he really gives it a shot because I think there's something there. There is things to mold. With him, it, you're. It's taking on the fifties and O's. It's the spectacle. It's mm-hmm. it's doing these weird YouTube boxing yeah. matches that turn people off because they 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 are so clouded by all of that that they can't see what you have here is a guy who's a good wrestler and understands uh-huh. has a feel for for fighting. He has a, a feel. He has an instinct yeah. for it, and it's there. It's really there. I would I would love to sit with him and 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 and, ex- and like really map out a game platform because but not again, against floyd mayweather but exactly exactly but if he was facing so and so who's one and oh in mma and one and oh in muay thai uh-huh. i wouldn't mind him fighting i actually think he would have a right, legit like a, chance even a professional uh, who was one and oh yeah uh, n- no, really? no no okay. no but like an amateur an amateur fighter right. like an am- amateur mma or boxing fighter i legitimately think there are things in, in logan paul's game that if you cleaned up the cardio Got him to a strength and conditioning guy. Um, you know, did some things with him that he ha- and that by the way, he has the money to do. He can be good. And he can and and look, asking a guy who's got like what, 40, 50 million dollars. I he said something like he he reported like something. Logan Paul? Yeah, he Lo- Logan Paul re- reported like what was it, sixteen million or something like that. I I might be exaggerating the numbers, okay. but he's got millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. I, yeah, he's yeah. definitely not focused on on boxing and MMA being the next. No, he's next focused grade. on his YouTube channel. Exactly, and this is what this is for. It's for his YouTube, YouTube channel. channel. It's not to. It's not to give him a boxing legacy or credentials. I mean, he is a fighter, but it's not to beef up his boxing resume. It's definitely not going to help Floyd in any way. And Floyd is retired, as we've stated. But I just think Floyd Mayweather is. <sighs> I just I don't want to take this take of like he's ruining the sport because he's not, but he but it's but it is kind of like people are saying boxing is dying, like this is helping it die. This is just feeding it more pills or whatever or I whatever mean, they do to. Yeah, no, it's true. I, I and again, that's that's where I was trying to like I'm trying to like give some salt to the fact that like look again for the last time I think Logan Paul has things here, just not. Don't take on these stupid matchups because, mm-hmm. you know, if this is a, what is like there, there is a definitely that's what I'm trying to explain here is I think there's definitely an ego thing to this. I think there's mm-hmm. a there's a oh, I think I can step in here thing to it. Like, you know, and, and I get it. Like, you're just doing a YouTube channel. You're just going around. Yeah. Right. But like if you wanted to show do the Idris Elba route where Idris Elba goes and takes on a, a kickboxer. Right. Right. Do, like, don't do these things where you're taking on some of the best because it kill the name value kills the sport right yeah. um and and again the conor mcgregor thing i like stefano said it as much as i was very much against it and as much as i said here's habib waiting for you right there at the lightweight division there's jose aldo waiting for you right there and you're taking it Two things stopped me. One, I knew the colossal amount of money that was there. Yeah, made. I was going to say, right. that's, that's a little different. Right, the colossal amount of money. But the other thing was that this was a good lesson to show people that if you're an MMA fighter, right, you are not being a specialist in their specialty. You're not being a Thai guy in a Muay Thai match. You're not being a kickboxer in a K1 match. And you're not, and you're sure as hell not being a boxer <laughs> in a boxing match. You're not match. beating the boxer right? in, the, in a boxing <laughs> match. <laughs> right? Um, you know, but at the same time, if you're a specialist and you go on to MMA and you haven't rounded up the other parts of your game, hmm. you're going to get shown a lesson real quick. Like yeah. James Tony got shown a lesson yeah. against uh, Randy Couture who was a little past his prime. Yeah. So the, these lessons need to happen. 
Yeah. I understand. But for Logan Paul, you're not learning a lesson. You're just getting a regular guy who makes millions of dollars off the street. A regular yeah. guy who makes millions of dollars. But, yeah. you know, you're getting a guy who just, who, yep. yeah, you know, who doesn't really do this, yeah. right, in any facet, whether it's MMA or what, what have you, come in here and he's going to get, you know, what, like he's going to get, uh, you know, shown the gears here. And even if by some miracle Logan Paul wins, does that not even hurt boxing more because yes. a regular guy came off the street and, and beat Floyd Mayweather, one of the greatest boxers of all time, when yeah. Manny Pacquiao couldn't do it? Yeah. It looks bad, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there'll always be that excuse of Logan Paul's got 40 pounds on Floyd and yada, 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 but it just seems like a lose-lose situation in my opinion. Yeah. But you want to get to the real take? Sure. The real Jeremy's take. Can All we right. talk about how Kawhi Leonard saved Pascal Siakam from being uh, the ridicule of the city? The uh, What's the word that they use for the town, the village? <laughs> the village the, idiot. The, <laughs> see, Kawhi Leonard losing in the second round of the playoffs has actually, in my opinion, saved Pascal Siakam from getting destroyed online yeah. like immediately after the boston celtics series pascal siakam was getting ripped they were talking about shit pascal siakam look look you know we what? Could I, will lie. I will lie some of it was borderline racist too i gotta i, I gotta use one all right all right <laughs> you talk about this yeah no i i won't lie some of it was borderline racist but but um yeah no it was i remember there's a lot of people saying hey you know paul george we could have got Paul George for for and we didn't because of Pascal Siakam. And you know, we saw what Paul George did. And look, it there there is an aspect to it where you know, Kawhi I de I think definitely saved. Um was definitely saving uh Pascal Siakam because of his disappointing performance. Excuse me. But I also think that look it. Um I think people – I think the the thing about this society um, – and Jeremy, I'll say this again, I guess, if Jeremy comes back – when Jeremy comes back. But the thing about this society is that we are – what's the word? We are so um, – we have the attention span of a squirrel seeing an acorn – and then seeing a tree. It's like we, we we are gone. We don't have a good attention span. So I also think that everyone was going to get on Pascal Siakam for about two weeks. Something else was going to happen and people were going to forget. Right? Just as they did with Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan. Right? With LeBron. They were going to see. They were going to. What's the word? See something else. Completely forget about it. And then all of a sudden they'll forget that Pas of that Kyle Lowry and Demar Derozan are chokers, right? Or so they think. So while yeah, you know, I, the other element to this too as well is that maybe Paul George isn't as good as we thought he was. Um, and this makes another disappointing playoff outing for him, as for three straight years, he's kind of been the butt of people's jokes. Um. You know, oh, Jeremy's back. But yeah, like, I think, I think, uh, to answer your question though, I don't think, I think th the way society is, Pat, they were, people would have forgot about Pascal Siakam in that time span anyway. Something you covered else. Paul George? Yeah, I was about and to. Paul George. I was about saves, to say that. Yeah. I was about to say that. Paul George, I think, isn't as good as we think he is. Um, and. No. I would have to agree. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and the, the whole thing is too with it is that, well, uh, I think we were. I think it was me and you who were having this discussion about some people just aren't like top level elite players. Some people are just really good role players. Well, I, I've always said this is that the problem with the NBA nowadays is because you know there's twenty. Was it was it twelve people on the East, twelve people on the West, and there's like fifteen teams each? Is that they try to make an All Star for every team? They try to balance it out. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, if you score twenty points. No matter how bad your team is, yeah. No matter how many, how much points you give up on defense, no matter how much, um, your how much your true shooting percentage is garbage and and whatever, all of a sudden, if you shoot t like twenty three points on forty two percent shooting, you're a star. Yeah, you're a star. 
And I'm not saying that's Paul George. I actually think Paul George puts up good numbers. I think mm-hmm. Paul George is a good defender. Um, not good defender, elite defender. Um, I think Paul George can turn it on and be something. But realistically, in this league, there's only real realistically five superstars, right? Um, LeBron, KD, LeBron. KD, LeBron, Kawhi, Giannis. Giannis, and... Harden. Yeah, Harden. Right, everybody and else. Oh, okay. And Luca, Luca's a bubble. Yeah, He's Luca. Like a bubble superstar. Luca will get there. Luca yeah. will get there for sure. Right, and and you know, Jason Tatum, I think can get there. I think yeah. can get there. Yeah, I think so too. Right, but but realistically, it's only those five guys. Right, yeah. like why why do we make Kyrie Irving a super? Of course, Kyrie Irving's a Hall of Famer, but is he a superstar? What are we talking about? Mm-hmm. Why, what are we talking about? Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis has only gone out of the first round one time in his career yeah, those guys, without LeBron. Yeah, those guys aren't going to get you to a finals, let alone a conference finals. Right. You know, by like them, by themselves, no. Nah. Right. Like LeBron James took. But people, Gibson. but people want to, but people want to hate on Demar Derozan for being bounced out by LeBron. I mean, that was bad. But still. Yeah, but like my whole point is, is that realistically, like, and this is where I got on people about Kyle Lowry. It's not that Kyle Lowry was bad. In fact, statistically, his championship season year statistically is the worst playoff year he's actually had. Right. In some metrics, not in all metrics, but right. in some metrics, it's the worst playoff year he's ever had. Mm-hmm. Right. And the year that everyone got on him the most, aka the one where they went to Indi- they faced Indiana in the first round and nearly coughed it up. Right. That year was statistically his best playoffs. The difference is the reason why people get on for that year and not for the others is that in that year. Where he had his best playoffs, he was miscast as the star. Right. And in the year at, and the year that we won the championship, he was properly cast as number two on a championship level team. Right. Maybe lo- number three, depending on what you feel about Pascal Siakam. Paul George. Right. Is miscast as the superstar. So when pa- Kawhi Leonard and Paul George are playing against another team. Now they should have won that. They should have won that series. They had a three-one lead, and they copped it up and they blew it. But everyone's on Paul George because they think Paul George is supposed to take over the game. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's not what Paul George is, at least anymore. Fair, but Paul George still. Uh, granted, I don't know what your overall point you're making is, but Paul George still didn't play well as his as the number two in those in that in that game seven. Well, the point I'm trying to make is is that because he's not – because there's only five superstars, you're not – Oh, that's guys, why he's getting more hate for not living up to what our uh, expectations Expectations are. of a right. star because we uh, we expect everybody on every team who makes an all-star team to now be a star. Right, right, But right. they're not. Right. They're not. And and you know what happens to people who aren't stars? Yeah. They choke in the playoffs because people key in on them and they can't just be a guy who gets you buckets. Okay. I want to talk about. I want. I still want to talk about Pascal, but quick. Do you blow up the Clippers or do you go one more year? They have to. They yeah, give up all the. They give, <laughs> give up all their picks. Yeah. They have to. Yeah, like, basically. Well, I also think this is an aberration. I think that look, people forget they were up sixteen in Game Five and uh-huh. sixteen in Game Six. All right. And, do you think there's a? Do you think there's a future if they keep? Kawhi, Paul George, and maybe those key pieces, Lou Will, uh, yeah, yeah, Pat, no, Pat I, Beverly. I think, I think there. Do you think there's a championship in their future? Yeah, no, like, like that's the thing. I think everyone's kind of over, like, right. what's the word? Over, over, um, reacting, maybe? overreacting. Because yeah. I think I think this is a good team. Again, sixteen point lead against the Nuggets in Game Five. Uh huh. Sixteen point lead against the Nuggets in Game Six. They just, they just, and they didn't they just seal the deal. The bed. Yeah, right. This was more of an indictment on the Clippers. And then Game 7, Kawhi has an uncharacteristically bad playoff yeah, game. Yeah, So, you know, which never happens. Like, not, at least not in Toronto. Yeah. Ergo, Kawhi, yeah. come back to Toronto. Come back. Come, come back. back. Baby, come back come, home. Baby, come back. Right. Come, come back home. You say, baby, you can always come home. Right. Martin, if you for the from Martin sitcom fans out there. Yeah. You can always come home. But you know, seriously, like I think I think this is a good team. I think people are overreacting. Um, this was an aberration, right? This is the, this was more so the Clippers pooping the bed than it was the Nuggets being. And, and that and no disrespect to Jamal Murray, the Canadian. We support Canadians here. Oh yeah, Jamal Murray, you went off, bro. Yeah, but yeah, no, I think this was an aberration. I think this was yeah. an aberration. Okay, so do you think that 
Raptor fans can sometimes be. I'm a Raptors fan as well. Uh, I love our Raptor fans. But do you think that we can sometimes have too much belief in our team? Do you think that we saw how well the Raptors were doing this season and we were and we threw all our preseason expectations out the window and said we're going for it all? We're going for it all. Or were we already saying we're going for it all and it was championship or bust from the beginning of the season? Going into this season, I thought the Raptors were going to end up fifth going into the playoffs. I thought it was going to be the Bucks, the the Sixers, the Celtics, and then I thought it would be the – the no, I thought they were going to be better than the Heat, but I thought that – um. I thought they were they were going to be in that fifth or fourth spot, maybe uh, competing against Indiana for that fifth or fourth spot. But uh, as the season went on, I kind of am guilty of this too. I started to say, you know, the Raptors can do it, which they showed that they could. They were they were beating, uh, they were winning big games. But what once um, the playoffs went on went on and Pascal Siakam was struggling from the jump. Do you think uh, people kind of were mad that for like the first time in a f- in maybe three or four years a guy wasn't ascending and maybe kind of took a step back? Uh, okay. The reason why I would say no um, to the overreaction is because my expectations for this team from the jump were higher than a lot more people's. You that know? is true. You know. Um, I said, and I quote, and I said, I, I remember being on Soccer Ball Radio and saying there should be no reason why the Raptors are not third place in the East. Mm-hmm. If everyone plays the way they're supposed to play. I didn't even say if everyone plays the way, if, like, they progress or what. I just said if they, everyone plays the way they're supposed to play, third place. Um, what I will say, though, is I didn't think they were going to get past the second round. Okay. Um, the reason why is because... Well, after the first round, you're going to run into a good team. So if you didn't think we were supposed to get past the second round, why are people mad that we lost? Because it was so close? It's because the Raptors, yeah, but it's also because they coughed it up, right? Like, you look at that at the ending sequence of Game 7. I think we can all agree that the Celtics were the better team in that series. They were the better team, but the Raptors kind of did kind of let them off the hook because the Celtics were coughing it up, right? So, so. Let's let's look back at the, the the timeline of events, and we gotta go in about five ten minutes. But right, right. let's let's look at the, the timeline of events. So, Kyle, Kyle Lowry fouls out, right? But he fouls Robert Williams. Was it Grant? No, it was Robert Williams. And Robert Williams is an okay free throw shooter, but not the best. So you think he misses one or two? Mm. Um, but he misses both. He misses both. So mm. if the Raptors get the ball on this rebound here. The Raptors could possibly tie or win the game, right? And a two, obviously, gang a two is better than gang a three. Mm-hmm. But they don't. You know who grabs the rebound? Jason Tatum. Yeah. Un- unchecked. No one blocks them out. Unchecked. Gets the rebound. And then gets fouled by Norman Powell. Yeah. Jason Tatum goes to the line. Makes one of two. So the Raptors, despite coughing it up and not getting a rebound, still have a chance to tie the game. Here's why I'm saying it was. Hold on, reaction. hold on, hold on. Okay, Let's sorry, you paused. So I thought yeah, you were... No, I just, I just, I want people to understand, understand <laughs> the craziness of this situation that the Celtics are blowing it. They're giving you the the game. Yeah, you had some chances. Right, and then and then the Raptors get the ball off a miss, go the other way. Nick Nurse doesn't call a timeout. Fred Fleet dribbles the ball for about twenty seconds, and shoots a bad shot. Then they foul, and fade it complete. Do you understand where people can get upset? And I can understand where people can get upset, but look, the the general consensus I think is that people are happy that the Raptors had such a good season. But I do see this trend of looking for blame. And I will say that I think the reason why Raptors are doing this is because they had flashbacks to 2018, 2017, 2016, where the Raptors find ways to blow it. And then they're like, oh, here we go again, back into the dark ages of the Raptors. But see, so this that's is the crazy where, thing is that hold on, it's let not me just a dark get, age. Sorry, go let ahead. Let me just get around to my point is that uh, they'll have flashbacks and 
they'll get scared and then they start looking for players to blame. Like, who do we need to get rid of? Who do we need to get rid of? But the thing is that even compared to those seasons, I feel that this is still an improvement. The Raptors didn't just lay over. They didn't just break down. They, they, although, although, uh, they were responsible for Jason Tatum cat grabbing that rebound because no one bo- boxed out and Kyle Lowry fouled out, which, you know, uh, I, 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 that foul could have gone either way. I think it was, uh, it was a tough call. I but mean, it was definitely not a foul. Even that foul. It's the it's the it's the foul. But I just I smart. but I just feel like yeah. this is still an improvement, and this is still a chance to uh, this is still a chance to springboard into something better. So, I think the future for the Raptors like expect sort of the same similar kind of season for another year, and then you know they have some cast space. Where do you? Uh, they have some cast space. They can do some things in the future. Hopefully, get a free agent. I don't want to jinx it, but you know, hopefully, get a big marquee free agent. But where do you see the Raptors' future? I mean, yeah, if they do nothing, wrapping else, it up. I mean, we have to, yeah, yeah. But if they do nothing else, like I, I mean, you know, they, 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 then they, what do you call it? They, they kind of just foil around and and be what they are, right? <sighs> That's kind of sad, though. Right. That's well, after 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 going to the land of milk and honey. It's like you want to go back. Like you don't just want to go back to your you know your your regular pastries and stuff. Well, here's my thing. I would rather this Raptor team than the Demar Derozan and Kyle Lowry led. And I love Demar, but mm-hmm. I'd rather that t- this team than that. And I'd yeah. sure as hell rather it than the Chris Bosh years. Yeah, but and I'd sure as hell rather it was it just than- so good to feel a season where the NBA season. Ended the same time that your team season ended. I hear you. I hear you. Um, and 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 if and if you don't have that, if you don't have that instinctual gut belief going into every season, then it's like, of course, you're still gonna watch a team, you're still gonna cheer, but it's and I'll, I'll and I'll still go to Jurassic Park. That's my spot. But it's just you know, it's, it's like it's we, tough, we, we, yeah. we 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 want to grow. We want to. Like, Masao Jerry built a culture of growth, and we want to grow. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I I still think that it it is what it is there. Yeah. Yeah. You, excuse me. You got to do what you got to do. Um, well, next week's card is going to be a banger. So if you're ready, you're, you're not doing anything Friday, right? So come to the breakdown. Oh. Okay. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Well. There's no one here to threaten the children unless you want to give it a shot. No, nah, man. Jeremy loves the kids. Jeremy <laughs> loves the kids. <laughs> uh, you know if Stefano was here, he'd probably take that another way. Of course he would. It's Stefano. <laughs> Stefano's <laughs> like a freak. Uh, well, okay. In this crazy mixed-up world where things are kind of going uh, awry, remember, you got three things. You got life. You got family. And you got this podcast. Take it easy, everybody. Good day.